The life of King Charles III has been mapped out since birth, a path trodden by princes over and over through centuries of British history. But following his marriage to Diana, Charles's road to the throne took twists and turns unprecedented in modern times. The wedding may have been a fairy tale, but the marriage was anything but. As the new princess dazzled the nation and the world, the prince lingered in her shadow. Some say the marriage should never have happened, that the pair was simply incompatible. Others defend the original union, but argue that the strain of public life and relentless media interest took its toll. Over the next decade, during which the couple welcomed their sons, William and Harry, cracks began to show, and by the early 90s, the situation was unsustainable. In 1992, the late Queen Elizabeth had been on the throne some 40 years, but was about to face her biggest test yet. 1992 is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. <clears throat> In the words of one of my more sympathetic correspondents, it has turned out to be an annus horribilis. It had been a year of royal acrimony. The monarch's younger son, Prince Andrew, separated from Sarah Ferguson, while her daughter, Princess Anne, divorced from Mark Phillips. A huge fire took hold of the Queen's beloved Windsor Castle, and her financial affairs were splashed across newspaper front pages. And Princess Diana's unhappiness at her life behind palace doors was shockingly detailed in Andrew Morton's explosive biography. Just a month after the Queen's famous Annus Horribilis speech came the news of this next, even more high-profile, royal split. It is announced from Buckingham Palace that with regret, the Prince and Princess of Wales have decided to separate. Their Royal Highnesses have no plans to divorce and their constitutional positions are unaffected. This decision has been reached amicably and they will both to continue to participate fully in the upbringing of their children. Amicably, the Prime Minister said, but future revelations would paint a very different picture. In 1994, Prince Charles granted unprecedented access to his private life and the events leading up to his divorce in the form of a documentary and interview with his biographer, Jonathan Dimbleby. Did you try to be faithful and honourable to your wife when you took on the vow of marriage? Yes, absolutely. And you were? Yes. Until it became irretrievably broken down. Perhaps the prince thought the timing of his confessed adultery would cast him in a more sympathetic light, but as far as the public was concerned, the damage was done. The future king was seen largely as the villain, blamed for the breakdown of what was supposed to be the romance of the century. Your Royal Highness, can you still be king following your confession? I think he's a fool. A real fault. He's human. Oh, he made a mistake with him. And I feel sorry for him as well. I think he's terrible. And I don't think he should be king, no. The following year, Diana hit back with her now infamous BBC Panorama interview with Martin Bashir, where she stated, there were three of us in this marriage. That supposed third person, of course, being Camilla Parker Bowles, the woman who, though unthinkable at the time, would one day become queen. Charles and Diana divorced in 1996, but just a year later, the noise of adultery and scandal was silenced. It is with great regret that Channel 4 News reports the death of Diana, Princess of Wales. Few, if any, events will touch the lives of so many of us as the death in the early hours of this morning of Diana, Princess of Wales. The 31st of August 1997 is etched into the collective memory of a generation. A car crash in Paris cutting the life of a global icon to just 37 years at shattering speed. She was the people's princess. 
and that's how she will stay, how she will remain in our hearts and in our memories forever. Charles immediately flew to Paris to retrieve Diana's body and spent the immediate aftermath with his sons at Balmoral. The death of Diana left a nation in shock, a family in mourning, two boys stunned by grief, and a father, prince and heir in devastating, uncharted territory. It was a dark moment in British history and a bleak time for the monarchy. It would take time for Charles to win back public support and find the strength to follow his own heart. Much of that personal and public rehabilitation is credited to the woman Charles has clearly loved for 50 years. Described by her friends as straightforward and resilient, with a sense of both duty and humour, Camilla has been an enduring support for the king. She was Camilla Shand when the pair first met at a polo match in the 70s, and then, deemed an unsuitable match for the heir to the throne, married a British army officer to become Mrs Parker Bowles. The married mistress of Prince Charles and the third person in his marriage to Diana, she was never far from speculation and headlines. Her own marriage ended in 1995, shortly before that of Charles and Diana, but then it was a long uphill battle to be with the man she loved. A great proportion of the public still blame Camilla for the breakdown of Diana's marriage and, and Diana's unhappiness. And Prince Charles, if he goes for marriage with, the prince, with Mrs Parker Bowles as a potential future queen consort, he's going to throw the monarchy into very serious doubt. But it was a battle the prince was prepared to fight. He slowly and incrementally introduced her into public life and made it clear that he would not be forced to live without Camilla for a second time. So, despite years, decades even, of scrutiny and vilification, in April 2005, she married the heir to the throne and became Camilla, Duchess of Cornwall. Now, she's set to be crowned alongside him as queen. Together, they must put aside controversies of the past and submit to the demands of their new life on the throne. A hallmark of the late Queen's reign was her mystique, her ability to rise above politics and the press and to remain resolute in her neutrality. She dealt with 15 prime ministers over 70 years and we never really knew what she thought of them or their policies. Plus, being just 25 when she assumed the throne, nothing was known about her views before she was monarch. The same can't be said for her son. At 74, he spent much of his adult life championing causes he cares about and making his views known. Whether railing against modern architecture and the extension of London's National Gallery... What is proposed seems to me like a monstrous carmel on the face of a much loved and elegant friend. Or writing directly to government ministers to air his views in the controversial letters dubbed the Black Spider Memos... Are you worried about these letters? Are you still writing to ministers letters like that? Have yes. you not been behaving unconstitutionally by letters, writing letters like that? The interventions divided opinion. I never saw Prince Charles's dialogue with me as a cabinet minister as meddling. I saw him expressing his views. Often I agreed, sometimes I disagreed. Charles shouldn't be doing any of this at all. He's, uh, as heir to the throne, he is duty bound to keep out of um, politics. While certain campaigns provoked criticism, other aspects of Charles' advocacy are seen in a more positive light. In the 1970s, he founded the Prince's Trust, a charitable organisation that helps to improve the lives of disadvantaged young people. And the issue that has come to define his life's work is the environment and his steadfast campaigning for the fight against climate change. I don't know why, I've always felt it in my bones. 
ever since I was a teenager because I witnessed all around me in the 1960s the destruction of, of exactly this. The complete destruction of so much biodiversity, so many of the, the things that actually we needed to maintain. It was a crazy stage, I think, we went through of it doesn't matter anything, you would throw it all away, it didn't matter, it was irrelevant. And somehow we were the masters of, you know, of nature. From farming his own organic produce to installing solar panels on Clarence House, converting his car to run on waste products or shining a light on conservation initiatives, his commitment to the natural world is undeniable. He was an early advocate for the issue that now dominates the agenda of succeeding generations, an achievement praised by Joe Biden when they met at the COP26 summit in 2021. If you need you badly. Oh, you're very kind to say. No, no, not this in it. Yeah. Whole thing going. That's how it all started. However, whether they were met with controversy or congratulations, one thing was always clear. Charles's decades of campaigning as the Prince of Wales would have to be left behind with the title. As the sovereign, he must follow his mother's example. On the 8th of September 2022, the time came to fulfil that duty. Head of the Commonwealth, head of the country, head of the royal family. 70 years on from his mother's accession, he has inherited a different Commonwealth, a different country and a different royal family. And the challenges have already arisen. Ripples of republicanism in Commonwealth countries such as Jamaica have potential to grow into waves as nations reflect on whether a distant king should remain head of state of former colonial territories. It's nothing personal. It's not about Queen Elizabeth or King Charles. It is getting a head of state who is Jamaican. Then there's the changing landscape at home, where a rising cost of living and falling living standards cast the pomp and circumstance of monarchy into a harsher, more critical light. When Elizabeth became queen in 1952, three in 10 people believed she was chosen by God. Now the monarch must work harder to prove their worth. Though the most immediate challenge is even closer to home. A family rift, with two sons separated by the Atlantic Ocean and deep personal conflict. Prince William, the heir, steps into the shoes long worn by his father, treading his own path as the new Prince of Wales and shouldering the weight of the looming crown. Prince Harry, the spare, continues to pursue life in the US outside the royal fold, harboring resentment and, in his own words, trauma from his time in the royal institution and family. It had never been a simple father-son relationship. The breakdown of a marriage, a mother's untimely death, and a contentious stepmother would be difficult enough for any family, let alone the most famous family in the world. And then the relationship fell off a cliff edge after Harry's very public claims that he and his wife Meghan were failed by the firm, victims of vicious competition between royal households and thrown to the bloodthirsty wolves of the media. But through it all, the king and his sons have always insisted on the deep love they have for one another. Though the potential for reconciliation is uncertain and even unlikely, it is not inconceivable and remains the foremost question of the start of Charles's reign. The accession of a new monarch is a phenomenon barely seen in living memory. A moment of change in an institution that relies on its ability to stay the same and a look to the future of an establishment so rooted in the past. Britain has just emerged from the longest reign it has ever seen, where Queen Elizabeth was the constant symbol of stability. As King Charles finally comes face to face with his destiny, it's hard to predict how this new Carolean era will unfold or come to be defined. But what is certain is that whether a sensitive schoolboy or passionate campaigner, a medieval prince or voice of the future, a husband, father, son or heir, 
Charles III has held a great many titles. Through tragedy and joy, he's waited and watched and listened and learned. And never before has a monarch been so prepared to wear the crown. <laughs>